Pray with me. Grant, O God, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts would indeed find acceptance in your sight. God, you are our strength and our redeemer, and I pray that you would speak through me or in spite of me as we continue to look at the big picture, putting the puzzles together of the holy book that you have given to your church, the Bible. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. We all love a good underdog story, right? Our movies and our stories are full of underdogs. In honor of this past week being Star Wars Day, may the fourth be with you if I didn't get to uh, share with you. Uh, Here's a phenomenal underdog clip. Insignificant rebellion. You're, you're a nothing, she was told uh, over and over and over again. Until this time, I am all the Jedi. We love a good underdog story. We love the underdog in sports, too. Obviously, you know my favorite uh, underdog story. Down three games to one, clawing back into the series, then losing all the momentum in game seven, rain delay, going into extra innings. The greatest underdog game ever was played on a Wednesday in Cleveland. I had to do that to all the Cardinals fans and White Sox fans and whatever else, but we can all agree that we miss baseball, right? We love underdogs. Musician and Bible speaker uh, Gene Watson was an out-of-work single mother who didn't know how she was going to pay her rent, how she was going to put food on the table for her children. All she owned was her violin. And one day she was playing when her landlord came to her apartment to collect her past due rent. And after hearing her play, he told her with eyes full of tears, keep the money. Use it to get yourself a job playing that violin. Her hope began to be restored. Eventually she was hired by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Now she's gone on to a successful solo career as a musician and and Bible teacher. We love underdogs. Yet in the story of human history, I think the greatest underdog story is of a Nazarene rabbi born under some really strange circumstances who gathered around him a group of no-account followers that nobody would want to have follow them. He loved underdogs, so he healed the sick and the broken. He lifted up the downtrodden and pushed back against the bullies. Remember the accusation against him that's written on our altar. He welcomes sinners and eats with them. He challenged the religious and political leaders of his day uh, to the point that they decided to kill him on a cross. This underdog was no ordinary man because three days after burying him in a tomb, he rose from the dead and changed human history. He never wrote a book. He never led an army. uh, He never founded a city. But the movement he began spread from a few dozen people to over one-third of the world's population. The underdog, this underdog, his life splits human history from, from B.C. before Christ to A.D. Anno Domine in the year of our Lord. More books have been written about him than any single person in history. Schools, hospitals, orphanages have been established in his honor. The greatest underdog in all of history, of course, is Jesus. And this underdog not only changed the course of human history, but bringing it down a little closer to home, he's changed my life. And he's changed the lives of so many who gathered together this morning to worship, not just on our stream, but all around the world. Our lives have been changed. 
We've been set free by the greatest underdog in history. So today we continue in part four of our series on the big picture of the Bible, and we're going to talk about Jesus. We're putting together the puzzle pieces and considering six movements that are are really three movements, uh, but this this third movement, creation, fall, redemption, has four subsections. So here's where we've been. We've looked at creation, that God created everything, including us, completely and perfectly from and for community. We've also looked at the fall that we, we, like Adam and Eve, declare our independence from our creator by rebelling against him. But even in our sin, God still loves us and pursues us. Last week, we began looking at this third movement of the Bible, uh, redemption, subsection one with the history of God's people, Israel. Israel's cycle of destiny, disobedience, and deliverance, that's our journey too. Today we make our way past the 39 books of the Old Testament and make our way to the 27 books of the New Testament. And we begin our survey of the New Testament with this underdog, Jesus. And with that predictable pattern that we found in Israel's story of destiny, disobedience, and deliverance, Jesus was and still is God's ultimate solution for the problem of sin for our planet. Jesus is the Deliverer. Everything else was just patchwork to that point. The sacrificial system was patchwork, and it all pointed, the entire Old Testament points toward the final solution for the deliverance of the human race and the entire creation. Jesus, the underdog, came to once and for all reestablish the relationship with God that, that the first humans enjoyed with God in the beginning. And he came to do that by creating a movement, probably not just a movement, a a revolution. It was a movement of love. When I used to work at at church camp in the summers, one night each week, our our evening game was uh, faculty find. And it was really just a massive game of hide and seek that took over the entire camp. Uh, For the high school week and sometimes at junior high, we had to get really creative with how we would hide because they were really good at seeking us out. I remember I spent one whole night lying in a camouflage sleeping bag in a pile of leaves, and I still got found before the bell rang. My friend Sean was the only one not found that night. He spent the night floating in, in the lake, uh, holding on to the side of the floating dock, and just shifting ever so slightly from one side of the dock to the other as people shine their flashlights to find him. He may have won the game, but I think he lost the war because he got nipped by turtles a lot that night. By the point in the summer that the younger campers came, we were all tired. We needed breaks. And it was really hard to get breaks with the younger campers because they usually latched on to one faculty member and we became their their person. So faculty find became our way to get a break. We would send all of the junior counselors to go and hide. And us older counselors with driver's licenses... We ran into town to pick up the movie rental and the pizza. And the kids thought we were hiding, so it all worked out, but it really wasn't a fair way to play hide-and-seek, was it? Here's the deal. The God who goes and looks for the hiding, shame-filled Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, he continues his search for wayward men and women throughout all of human history. Jesus is God's ultimate seeker. God and Jesus wants to free and redeem our lost planet. There's a really popular worship song right now called Reckless Love, and the bridge says this, There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. That's the God who seeks. That's what Jesus came to do. And as we take a look at the life of Jesus, there's so many things we could, we could say about him, so many sermons we could fill. So we're going to need to take that 10,000-foot view again. So we're going to focus on four distinct parts, really briefly, of Jesus' life. His birth, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. And, and any time we talk about Jesus, if we're honest about it, we have to ask this question, which Jesus are we talking about? Because we all have this tendency to make Jesus into who we want or need him to be. 
If we need advice, he becomes self-help Jesus. If, if we want or need something, he becomes Santa Jesus. Uh, if we think someone else is wrong, we use Jesus to point out how wrong they are. If we want someone to rubber stamp our behavior, he becomes buddy Jesus. And we all do this in, in many ways. But when we look at the Bible, it challenges us to allow Jesus to define himself and this, again, is another reason why we're doing this series and we're, we're making this argument that as followers of Jesus, we have to become serious students of the Bible. Here's what Paul wrote about Jesus in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross." If you want to know what God is like, take a look at Jesus himself. Jesus was God, was and is God in the flesh. So we're going to do this really quick flyover of the life of Jesus. The four uh, ancient biographies we find of Jesus, what we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they paint a picture of Jesus who came to start a movement of love that challenges our sinful, selfish ways and replaces them with his own character. He came to tear down dividing walls. Jesus was the one who radically invited outsiders to become insiders. And even at that, the crowds that spent time with Jesus repeatedly wanted to turn him into a different kind of king who would overthrow the Romans with brute force. But Jesus was and is a different kind of king who started a different kind of movement. So today, I want us to consider what it means for you and I to be a part of the Jesus movement, following a different kind of king. And I think you'd probably agree with me, looking at our world right now, that we need a Jesus movement to turn the hearts of of people in, in our world back to God and one another. Ours is a world of hate and division. And it will take a movement of Jesus to transform the deep inner character of people to to fix what ails us. Imagine a people who not only speak the words of Jesus, but do the works of Jesus. That would change our world. That's a movement. So four things to consider about joining the Jesus movement. First, when I follow Jesus, I'm following a different kind of king whose birth was scandalous. Now, I've had some royal babies born in my life, Marky Moo and Sailor Bug. And while they are my princesses, there was nothing scandalous about their births. We expected them. They came in the usual way. Yet when you read the narrative of of Jesus' birth that we find in Matthew and Luke, his birth and the circumstances surrounding it were full of scandal. Mary and Joseph are are not yet married, and she turns up pregnant. And in those days, the penalty for that was death. And yet, it's exactly into this kind of a scandal of, of birth that the Jesus movement begins. Angels appear to Mary and reassure her that her son would be a different kind of king, leading a different kind of movement. Luke 1, 31 to 33, And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. In a nation with a history of kings, this announcement had to sound odd to Mary. Joseph was from the lineage of David. But he was far removed from royal blood as a poor carpenter and and she a peasant girl from nowhere Nazareth. Kings are born in important places like Jerusalem. And on top of that, the the angel said that the kingdom that Mary's son would establish would never end. It doesn't take a history major to realize that kings serve and then they're either killed, banished, or die. But the angels tell her that her son, the one she's to name Jesus, 
he would rule forever. There are just some things in our world that are oxymorons. Two words that don't go together. Jumbo shrimp. Deafening silence. Clearly confused. Virgin birth. That Mary was a virgin who conceived and gave birth to a child without the assistance of of a man are two things that do not go together. But his scandalous birth declares that this, this is a different kind of king who came to start a different kind of movement and that he was indeed God in the flesh, fully God, fully human. That's the origins of our king. That's the king we follow. Second, when I follow Jesus, I'm following a different kind of king whose ministry was challenging. Except for a few days at the age of 12, we don't know much about Jesus' life from, from birth until uh, age, age 30. The Bible tells us that he grew up in a small village called Nazareth, and, and that day it was a no-account town of less than 500 people. Then at age 30, we suddenly see him reappear. He's baptized by his cousin John. He's tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And when he comes out, he's preaching, he's teaching, and he's healing. And when we talk about Jesus' teaching, preaching, and healing ministry, it doesn't take long to figure out that these elements of his ministry were challenging, to put it lightly, challenging to both the religious and the irreligious people of his day and our day. So Jesus was a teacher, or they would have called him rabbi. This is why we see Jesus going into all the synagogues and teaching from the Torah and and teaching with parables, which was a common uh, teaching method for Jewish rabbis in the first century. But what makes the, the, the Jesus movement, what makes him a different kind of king with a radically different kind of teaching is that he always raised the bar. It was always his challenging teaching ministry that that set him apart from the other teachers and and movement leaders of his day. For example, rabbis taught their students to love their neighbors. This was commonplace for Jews in a world filled with hate and animosity, and it would have been a challenge. But let's see how Jesus ups the ante about who and how to love in Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This was then, and I would argue now, still unheard of. Most people would would not argue with being a good, loving neighbor. We certainly wouldn't argue with hating your enemies. But Jesus raises the bar and challenges people in his teaching about how we love our neighbors. Love your neighbor, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, those who commit evil against you. Are you serious, Jesus? Maybe we've lost something in translation here. There's got to be a loophole about hating murderers and tyrants and White Sox fans. But no, no. This is the kind of radical teacher that Jesus was. He taught a lot of other radical things about prayer and money and what it meant meant to be first and maybe most importantly about who God loves. And Jesus' radical, challenging teaching got him in hot water. This is the king that we follow. Third, when I follow Jesus, I'm following a different kind of king whose death was offensive. Jesus' teaching, preaching, and healing increasingly and ultimately got him into hot water with the religious leaders of his day. And for the political leaders, the great crowds that he drew everywhere he went, it made them nervous. Because many wanted Jesus to overthrow the Roman government. On Palm Sunday, they shouted out Hosanna, that Hebrew phrase that means save us now. The leaders thought that he was writing in to start a war. So they hatched a plan to have him killed. And the Jewish leaders had pretty limited authority with with what they could actually do in carrying out that kind of punishment, so they they sent Jesus to Pontius Pilate. He had Jesus flogged, which was pretty brutal in and of itself, but then he tried to release him. They demanded that he be crucified, and they said, he claims to be our king. Bingo. Now Pilate had to act. John 19, 13 through 14. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. 
Jesus, this one who came to start a different kind of movement of love, was crucified. And ironically, there was a sign hung above his head that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This was who he was. But on that Good Friday, few could see the truth of the sign. Jesus' death was an offense. And it's offensive because criminals die on crosses, not kings. This is the different kind of king we follow. Jesus was a king who died on an offensive criminal's cross so that we might be reconciled to God. Remember Paul said that, that, that God was pleased to reconcile all to himself through the blood of Jesus' cross. He died an offensive death so that our offenses against God might be removed. It's the truth of that passage of scripture that everyone knows that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. He died an offensive death so that the stain of of our offenses, of our guilt, of our shame could be wiped away. This is the deliverer, the one who has set me free, the one who has set you free, the one who who still reigns as Lord and King of the universe, who who sends the Holy Spirit to, to convict us of our sin, to comfort us in our affliction. This is the Jesus, this is the king we follow, that by reconciling us, he's the one that has, that has taught us that, that we're to love one another, we're to love our world recklessly in the same way that he loves us. Finally, when I follow Jesus, I'm following a different kind of king whose resurrection was restorative. We just celebrated Easter and we know the rest of the story. But indeed, it is the best story. The church only truly has one story. He is risen. Everything else pales in comparison to this story. If this didn't happen, nothing else matters. We have one story. He is risen. Oh, but it's a good story. He was resurrected from the dead on the third day. And in one of Paul's letters, he describes the events this way. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. For I handed on to you as of first importance what in turn I had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. The bodily resurrection of Jesus was and is no myth verifiable eyewitnesses saw Jesus with their own eyes. They touched, embraced, talked, walked, and ate with the resurrected Jesus. And if you were watching on Easter, you remember that I preached about the two friends on the road to Emmaus. Luke tells us a story about a man named Cleopas and his friend who were, who were other followers of Jesus. And on Easter, they found their, their heads spinning and their faces downcast because of everything that had happened for the past three days. The resurrected Jesus appears to them on the road to Emmaus, and and they don't recognize him. So Jesus does his own version of long story short and explains how all of the Old Testament had pointed to this happening. And the day was drawing to a close, and the two walkers on the Emmaus road still don't know that it's Jesus. But they beg him to stay and eat and spend the night with them. It was only when they sat at the table and he broke the bread that they recognized Jesus. Luke 24, starting with verse 32, they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Hope was restored to these downcast followers as Jesus told them the long story short. This resurrected, different kind of king restored their hope 
And today, 2,000 years later, he can restore yours too. Your heart can be strangely warmed by the presence of the resurrected Jesus. This is the king we follow. This is the one that we say, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And if that's not a message that our world needs to hear right now, I don't know what is. Jesus makes the difference his scandalous birth, his challenging ministry, his, his, his offensive death. But his restorative resurrection tells us that the worst thing in our lives never has to be the last thing. That, that COVID-19 or political posturing or all of us grumbling about what's going on, that will not have the final say for us. That will not be the last word for the church. That will not be the last word for the people called Christian because he lives. He has restored our hope. He has restored our joy. Nothing else can take that away. His birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection make Jesus a different kind of king who started a different kind of movement. It wasn't a movement of political power or religious zeal. It wasn't a movement about uh, education or social or economic reform, although all of those things become a part of it. At its core, it's a movement about love, calling men and women who have wandered from God back to an Eden-like relationship with God, themselves, with one another. This Jesus, he was an underdog, and he came for underdogs like you and me. This is the king that we follow. Let's pray.